back here at CN Live's Election Central, and we're joined by the once globetrotting journalist <laughs> Pepe Escobar, who is now marooned because of the pandemic in Bangkok, Thailand. Pepe, thanks for coming on CN Live. How are you doing? Hi, everybody. Hi, Joe. Hi, Elizabeth. It's Hi, CN viewers. Look, it, it's completely. It's for me, like Joe said, uh, it never happened in my life for the past forty years being stranded in the same country for eight months in a row. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> maybe you'll start climbing those walls uh, pretty soon, but. Um, well, yeah, I'm going, I'm going to the mountains as soon as I have a break, you know, because oh. it's still the rainy season. Uh -huh. I, I'm going to the Golden Triangle for a few days just to relax because it, it, it's been completely demented, especially mm -hmm. the past four or five weeks. You know? Well, how is the virus going in Thailand right now? Is it Pretty much well, it's, to it's totally under control. 59 deaths. Yeah. It's one of the best records in the world. Uh, I think the best one is Vietnam, and Thailand is probably second best. But the problem is the country is uh, hermetically sealed, and they destroyed the economy. That's it. And uh, they saved lives. Wow, the, the, the real unemployment rate it's over 40 percent at the moment obviously you ne you never get this from the thai authorities of course but uh to talking to thai people around bangkok you you, you get a a feeling of how bad it is uh, I, and if you don't have jobs here people have to go back to their provinces where obviously there are no jobs as well so it's a vicious circle you know there's no foreign investment coming apart from the chinese uh, no business because a businessman cannot come here to strike deals. What so about government assistance? There's no government assistance to people who are out of work? Well, they ran out of cash. It was. It was the equivalent of uh, 160 US dollars a month, roughly. But they ran out of cash and now there's nothing. Wow. So it's, it's a dire situation, really. Uh, and we are in the middle of a color revolution as well. Well, that's right. I was gonna... <laughs> Which is a mix of color revolution and uh, those grievances about uh, the fact that this is a military dictatorship that only listens to itself and a monarchy that, unlike the previous monarch, uh, King Bumibol, is completely remote and detached from Thai people. The, the king spends most of of his time in Baviera, in a five-star <laughs> hotel, with his concubines, his horses, you know, his dogs and all that. And he comes here for a Buddhist ceremony or two. He, he's been here for the past two weeks or so. And then he flies back to- so He Israel. can get in and out. He's not hermetically shielded, anymore, unlike you. Uh, exactly. He can get in and out anytime he wants, Isaac. And he has a Schengen visa, a Schengen yeah. diplomatic visa, of course. Right. So he, right. he can go back and forth. Uh, and uh, the woke generation here, they are really fired up. You know, there, there have been protests for the past few weeks. Uh, there is a, a constitutional crisis because uh, the protests, they want the constitution to be rewritten because the previous uh, version favored the current military dictatorship. This guy's, there's a civilian leadership. It's an extremely complex situation and obviously thailand is in the middle of the u.s china of overall larger than life dispute right as yeah. uh, one of the branches of the new silk the chinese new silk roads but with lots of american investments here for decades you know so you know speaking of the constitutional crisis you may have heard that there's an election going on in the united states <laughs> Which is responsible for me not sleeping this week, Joe. Just <laughs> like you, Elizabeth, and everybody else watching us. <laughs> That's right. So uh, first, I want to ask you your personal view of what's going on. You know, you know the latest that uh, Biden sure. on the verge of maybe winning Pennsylvania. If he does, he'll get the 270 yeah. votes. But Trump made those remarks today from the White House. And then I'd like you to later speak, if you can, about uh, what China's views are of this election. Pepe, like, what, how do you, for, what sense do you make out of this if you can? What's going on in Washington? For, for, for the moment, uh, Joe, uh, the Chinese reaction is uh, extremely discreet. 
like you don't see editorials in the global times for instance or in the people's daily they are just it, it's a wait and see situation uh according to our think tank sources and the people that we know in in beijing or in Shenzhen, they obviously they would rather go for president kamala <laughs> <laughs> uh because of, all right maybe the the trade war would be softened a little bit sanctions they, they have no illusions that sanctions will will continue to be in place but it would be more uh, let's say less turbulent to deal with a democratic presidency but this is very informal yeah uh, you you don't see for instance higher ups in the in the politburo or people from the finance ministry you know uh, going on the record in Xinhua or in one of the major dailies saying anything about it for now right same with the russians it's wait and see you know uh, on tas uh, discussions at the valdai club the valdai club they had another great discussion this week about russia china eurasian integration on top of uh, their meetings two weeks ago which were amazing uh, they were not covered in the US, by the way, but uh, never are, never are. They are, they never are. But th this particular Valdai, which was a virtual Valdai, uh, I was very frustrated because I was supposed to go <laughs> normally, you know, and meet all 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 of them, and uh, you know, interview a lot of really really you know heavy hitters in the Russian economy and geopolitics and all that. But it had to be a. Uh, uh, virtual, but what Lavrov said, especially, and then uh, Putin's uh, intervention plus the Q and A afterwards was quite something in terms of the role of the state in the Russian economy, in terms of you know their drive towards a multipolar world, the Russia-China strategic partnership, and all that. So this was extremely important. Uh, I, I talked about it in one of my columns, but I suggest all of you to go to the Valdai Club website you can actually see uh, most of the discussions, most of the panels on video uh, with English uh, voiceovers, uh, not subtitles, with voiceovers, in fact. Uh, and it's a major contrast with what's going on in the US. Same in China, when they had uh, the approval of the five-year plan last week, the 2021-2025 five-year plan. And then when you put this all together, you see uh, two another world is possible mechanisms flowing in parallel and intersecting in many areas as well in contrast with the absolutely crazy western neo neoliberal obsession in fact which which includes the us not only europe but us as well but uh, coming back to <laughs> our larger than life saga, right? Um, to, today, today I did a gaming exercise, in fact. Uh, I wrote the column that I sent, uh, what, one hour ago. It's centered on a, on a gaming exercise, which I called it the blue gaming exercise. It's a, a color revolution exercise, but applied to the United States the land that conceptually invented the concept of, of color revolution. Of course, I, I used what's going on from the blue and the red side, uh, the accusations of fraud, uh, the legal battle that it's in front of us uh, ahead for the next few weeks. And I built a narrative that you can read as if it was one of those scenarios in the uh, transition integrity project the TIP. In fact, the scenario that I, that I put in my, in my exercise is very similar to one of their scenarios, but incorporating what happened since Tuesday night, especially that, that, that famous uh, <laughs> vertical jump in Biden votes in Wisconsin and Michigan. I incorporated that as well. Uh, Trump just told us a, a while ago about fraud again but without providing any smoking gun uh they can't because the republican lawyers and investigators and whatever is going to take them days 
they have to go through recounts. They have to compare uh, what really went on in many of these uh, polling places compared to registered voters. This is going to it's going to be hell, of course. But I incorporated all that in my column, and uh, it's uh, it it's a very very uh, cynical satire. In fact, you can read it as satire, and you can read it as a documentary of what happened these past three four days as well. So I'm very curious to what the response is going to be in the US for this column. Uh, I know that the response in the global south would be largely positive because most people in the global south, they are convinced that these elections are fraudulent in many levels on both sides. Uh, but I'm curious to see the American reaction, especially now where there's a, a censorship all over. You know that our friend Phil Giraldi, mm. who writes for Strategic Culture, you cannot link to his columns on Facebook for instance. Uh, our friend Andrew Koribko, uh, who, who's based in Mo American, but based in Moscow, he's being deplatformed everywhere because he goes against the mainstream na narrative. So many of us are being censored right and left <laughs> and in the middle as well. So this is very, very scary. And the fact that uh, if, if you point out like many of us did, and I also did, starting from last week, that what we're going to have with a damn presidency is the return of the blob. And not only the blob that was attached to the Trump administration, but the blob as we know it from Obama Biden 1 and Obama Biden 2. So we're going to have basically Obama Biden 3. And last year I gave names. Tony Blinken, you know, Michel Fournoy. You, you, you know about them more than I do, in fact. But a lot of people in the global south have no idea about these, uh, these people. And these are the people who will be behind American foreign policy in a damn uh, presidency. So it's very, very scary. And Phil Giraud in his columns, he says the same thing. Quoting Paul Kennedy's uh, imperial overstretched, he writes that basically forget about <laughs> a reversal of imperial overstretch. On the contrary. So expect... Uh, you know, incursions in Syria or in Ukraine, for instance, for 2021 is practically inevitable. And that's why a lot of people in the global south are extremely worried about it. If they find the, 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 the correct information about how this is going to morph into an Obama-Biden 3.0 administration. Do you think, Pepe, that uh, just a question on the census? Yes. I didn't know that about Phil or Andrew. You didn't know about Phil? Or Andrew, no, I didn't know that. Uh, ah. But you think that, uh, this is a small question, but if if Biden wins, will that continue? I mean, is it, or has this been an anti-Trump phenomenon that we're seeing? And if Trump's gone, will that end? But for censorship? And it's a very good question, Joe, because it depends. Uh, th there is a big tech censorship, in effect, against any journalist or analyst that contradicts the mainstream narrative, which is a damn narrative, essentially, De a, a damn shaped narrative, you know. So it's not a matter of defending Trump. It's a matter of asking questions. So it's a perfect legitimate question to ask about this uh, sudden vertical bumps in those votes in the middle of the night in Wisconsin and Michigan. We still don't have a definitive answer about it. Uh, the possibility that there was fraud in this election, which is very, very high, it's a perfect legitimate question or a set of questions as well. Uh, it has nothing to do, in fact, with Trump saying uh, these elections are fraudulent and he has no smoking, no smoking gun. That's one side of the story. Our role as journalists is to ask questions and to dig deeper. But uh, nowadays we can't. We, we, we simply can't. If, if we do, we are deplatformed or censored on Facebook or, you know, uh, accounts disappear on Google. Uh, like with Press TV, for instance. I, I was on Press TV, what, yesterday or two days ago. It's, uh, they are deplatformed a little bit everywhere. Or in the case of, uh, what's the name of that site? American uh, 
the American Conservative or American Herald Tribune or something like that. That's what I was reading today. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Th so thank you, Elizabeth. Which was proscribed, blacklisted, just like that, because uh, I know it's financed by the IRGC. This is ridiculous. I know Professor Tony Hall personally. It's his website. You know, he more or less does what 80% of what's published in the website. You know, it's practically a one man operation, maybe three or four people. He has nothing to do with Iran. The fact, the problem is that uh, uh, Professor Hall and myself, we've been to Iran a few times. So, in the eyes of the State Department and the deep state, we are all uh, Iranian agents, just like we are all Russian agents. And that's uh, uh, our friend Phil Giraldi. Uh, comes in. Everybody that writes for strategic culture comes in. Uh, uh, the, that, that other website, uh, Neo, jo Neo Journal, where William Engdahl publishes. Same thing. Uh, Stalker Zone, a website that is very, very good. Mostly Russian writers. And they have, for instance, the best Russian analysis of what happens in the Ukraine blacklisted as well so you know it's uh, it, the whole thing has to follow one format only and uh you know it, it it is the death of journalism by a thousand cuts uh so the the major cut was julian's story of course and all of us are you know the protagonist of the death by a thousand cuts they're going after everyone if you deviate from the norm, from the Ministry of Truth narrative, you know, it's, it's very, very scary. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, with his story with The Intercept, touched upon it as well. Different uh, uh, paths, but more or less the same story. So any one of us that deviate from, from, from the norm, now we are under attack everywhere. And consortium news as well, no question. Well, Elizabeth, uh, first of all, I want to give an update here. Um, two days ago, Trump had a 600,000 vote lead over Biden in Pennsylvania. It is now a uh, 26,000 vote lead with 95% of the vote counted, all the mail-in ballots. So he's hanging on by a thread, Trump. By a thread, yes. By a thread, and if Biden takes Pennsylvania, he gets That's it. electoral votes, he's... Declare exactly. the president, and then we'll see how Trump reacts. Elizabeth, do you have any questions? Well, I just wanted to comment that I agree with you, and I've been observing this, this censorship as well. I'm also very concerned about it. I agree that the job of journalists is to ask questions and be skeptical, and that there's nothing wrong with asking questions, as long as when you do, if you answer them and when you answer them, you do it factually. And I think that, uh, you know, even, even Consorting News got called Russian something or other by, I believe, a Canadian news outlet or a documentary that there's now, like, uh, litigation around. But so you really cannot escape this type, this type of smearing when you do seek the truth, and it happens to be truth that embarrasses power structures. Uh, I've asked this of almost every guest we've had on, but you brought up Julian Assange. What do you think will be the difference, if any difference whatsoever, and there may be none, between the Trump administration and a potential Biden administration when it comes to Julian Assange and the extradition attempt that is ongoing now to bring him from the UK to the US? That's a very good question, Elizabeth. We don't know if... if uh, of course, the, the ultimate decision is the deep states. It's a, a very entrenched and very powerful deep state factions in unison. They will decide the fate of Julian. In fact, uh, it's, <laughs> in fact, I see a dark winter scenario for him. No, 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 no matter who, who, who's in the White House, you know, it's, it's, it's a deep state phenomenon. He went against the deep state in public. That's anathema. So he has to be published. Nothing's going to change this equation, you know. So it's it's not a a, a bipartisan thing, or, or 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 in terms of uh, power politics or uh, who's in the White House. No, it it, it transcends all, all that. Just like what we are watching now. The way I see it, and I've been discussing this with with many friends and analysts. 
It is a kabuki theater, but it was more or less rehearsed and pre-programmed. Now we have essentially 50% of the US pitted against the other 50% of the US, maybe 52, 48, 51, 49. But the country is completely irreversibly polarized. Who profits from it? <laughs> you know better than I do, right? And that's it. So the, the, peop the people who, who run the gaming, who pre-programmed everything, who concocted different level of psyops, they are just observing remotely this pre-Civil War conflagration, which is after the inauguration, <laughs> whatever that is in January, is going to be even worse. So uh, like, rats, like laboratory rats in a cage. Yes, Joe, abs absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's, it's an extremely sophisticated psyops, in fact. And of course, the best American analysts, they know, they know this by heart and they, they can decode the details, but the general public, they have no idea. They are just polarized into their own formulas or mantras or uh, aggression, in fact. And they, they don't have enough critical thinking or critical tools to understand how they are being manipulated on all sides. And, that, and that's why it's terrible, because it, it has to do as well with this, uh, uh, you know, uh, the discourse nowadays flows through social media, where you can have a super PhD debunked by an absolute idiot with one adjective, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> I, I, I'm reminded of someone uh, who tweeted the other day, that it, it takes one idea to convince a thousand scholars and a thousand idiots. Uh, what is it? I'm, I'm screwing it up now. A thousand <laughs> details won't convince an idiot. Yes, and, and a thousand. Yeah, that's what it takes. One fact to convince a thousand scholars. Uh -huh. A thousand facts cannot convince one idiot. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so we are living this at twenty four seven. Full time, <laughs> so, and, and, there, and there's nothing we can do about it, you know. So, uh, I'm all in all my conversations. We're always talking about what's the point for us to keep writing long essays with lots of links, or quoting books, and what's, no, it's absolutely pointless. Yeah, you're gonna have an idiot from. Uh, you know the the, the 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 typical village idiot as Umberto Eco famously he said that before he died a few years before he died uh, i think it was one of the best things echo said in public ever he said that the internet had elevated the village idiot to the condition of an oracle <laughs> and there are and you have village idiots as oracles all over the place and there's nothing we can do about it well, and so one or the other is going to become president of the united states right? exactly <laughs> Exactly. And we have, exactly. exactly. Yeah, I was about to say, we have everything from QAnon on 4chan, which is the village idiot that you're describing in one way, but then you have the blue and on Russiagate village idiot speaking in the Washington Post and the New York Times and all these other outlets. So it's really a shambles across the board. And it seems like when it comes to the thousand fact joke, you know, Julian Assange gave us those thousand facts. He cited yes. on the side of the public. And as Joe and I were talking about earlier, when you really do look at it, obviously the public is not represented by whoever wins this presidential election or any presidential election. And so Julian Assange, by being on the side of the people, he's on the, he's against the side of both potential presidents. So either, like you said, that either way, he's not going to be served very well by whoever wins. Absolutely, Elizabeth. So uh, Julian remains the number one example for the whole planet of uh, what all of us who try to impart information or at least decode what's going on and try to explain to other people. Uh, the fate <laughs> that awaits us uh, in short term, mid term and long term, you know. Well, Pepe, I know why you keep writing. That's the same reason why I keep writing. It's for yourself to keep sane and to figure it out, not to be, to fight against this environment. I, I Orwell said that, uh, Writing was revenge 
uh, against, what was it? Uh, revenge against, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting this thing. It's, it's a revenge against reality. Basically. Yes. So you have to uh, preserve your own mind, keeping up with what's going on, figuring it out for yourself. And in the meantime, you might as well impart it to others if they're interested, right? You're right, Joe. It's, uh, it's a very romantic notion, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm always reminded of, uh, I always keep in my mind the Keats College, Byron, the, the Brit romantics, in fact. We do this, uh, it's an altruistic impulse. Uh, it's, uh, it's an inner drive. Uh, it's an impossible dream. <laughs> and uh, like uh, we create for ourselves the illusion that uh, what we do matters and what we do may change something, you know. Well, with age, of course, you understand that it may change one or two people, you know, you may change your family somewhere and all that, but that's it. Yeah, they'll stop uh, talking to you. That's yes. Change. <laughs> change your family. <laughs> <laughs> Is that they, they stop talking? Yeah, when they read your column. <laughs> that's how they change your family. Uh, Pepper, let me ask you this. Um, we're talking about the censorship. What happened with Greenwald is he wrote a piece about uh, these laptop emails and photographs of Hunter Biden. Mm -hmm. And the New York Post published it. And then, yes. as we all know, Twitter and Facebook simultaneously shut that down. And the whole New York Post which is the oldest continuously published newspaper in the United States, by the way, it's a tabloid and a lot of problems with it. But, and then Greenwald wanted to write a piece for the Intercept, which he co-founded and they wouldn't let him write. So he quit, gave up yes. a lot of money for that. So I'm curious about whether anybody in China knew anything about the Chinese Biden family connection. How does China see that? Look, you don't, you don't see this in, the, in Chinese media or even in commentary. And I asked some of our, uh, our friends in Hong Kong and Shenzhen, uh, is this being discussed in the Chinese way, both or instance, in Chinese social media or that? No. Uh, the Greenwald story for them is very remote. And very few Chinese have details about the intercept, about who Greenwald is, why he quit uh, uh, something that he co-founded, uh, the involvement of Pierre Omidyar, you know, virtually oh, I'm nobody. talking about the Hunter Biden story. Are they familiar with Hunter Biden? He's been in China. Yes, the, uh, exactly. You, you can see the public opinion in China is exactly. And this is something that you read in editorials in Xinhua or People's Daily or China Daily, etc. Et, et uh, there's, uh, it's, it, it's interesting the way most Chinese see it. It's a corroboration for them of the rot in American politics, which is something that is for them is already a, an established notion. So for them, this is an extra example, but with a different political party. Of course, for the past four years, they have been uh, absolutely <laughs> driven absolutely mad by everything that uh, the Trump administration throws at China. But now they see that the other party as well is internally completely corrupted as well. So that's why I think even on a, on a public opinion level in China, mass public opinion, as well as the leadership, there are no illusions about a damn presidency at all. Uh, they expect the sanctions to continue, essentially. Uh, they expect at least a measure of dialogue compared to what we had, especially these past two years. All right. But nobody's thinking, for instance, that uh, the sanctions are against Huawei are going to disappear. Be because this is being explained by Chinese media that it's uh, an American national policy, independent of uh, partisan politics. It's part of the uh, uh, national security strategy. Uh, China is uh, the top competitor, much more than Russia. They, uh, they understand the notion that China now is not only the top economic power in the world, the Chinese already see it. Uh, in, in fact, they analyze in terms of uh, PPP, not uh, gross GDP. So under PPP, in PPP terms, China is already the number one uh, economic power in the world, the number one trade power in the world. They're gonna clinch a mega uh, uh, trade deal 
around here in Asia, the RCEP deal, the Regional, Regional Comprehensive uh, Economic Partnership, which is what TPP, Obama's TPP, wanted to be. But in fact, we're going to have RCEP with China included and all the major players here, the, the ASEAN 10, the 10 Southeast Asians, plus Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. And the Indians in another fabulous example of stabbing yourself in the back, they are out. <laughs> so India is going to be increasingly irrelevant in trade terms across Asia. And next year, they're going to clinch the famous, which has been discussed for years now, China-European Union trade deal. Why is India staying up? Because of pressure from the U.S.? Uh, yes, for two main reasons. One, that they think that RCEP uh, is basically a, a China deal, which is not, because this has this is being discussed for at least for the past two or three years extensively among everybody, including India. Uh, but they say, no, we're going to be invaded again by Chinese products. You have to modernize your industry, your manufacturing uh, capabilities. Uh, India doesn't export anything uh, like China, good manufactured products. They are all made in India, stays in India. It's not exported. You know, you don't even find it in, in Bangladesh, for instance. You don't find, you, you find maybe what uh, textiles in, uh, but much more textiles from Bangladesh than India, but you find Indian textiles in parts of Asia. That's it, you know, not much. Uh, and the other reason is that the Indian elites under Modi, in fact, those Hindutva, Hindu nationalist supremacists, they actually believe in the Indo-Pacific concept. It's completely nuts. They think that they're going to be treated by Washington as, you know, same level players in the Indo-Pacific structure with uh, Japan and Australia as well. Completely absurd, a mirage, completely. But this is what they believe at the moment. So add one and two, and you know, uh, uh, they pulled out of the RCEP discussions and they said, okay, maybe we come in later. But then the, the train already left the station. They're going to sign this. They were supposed to sign this before the end of uh, 2020. Okay, maybe beginning of next year, but already left the station. Big trade deal with all the major East Asia players. And India will be out. You know, at least Australians uh, are aware that they are uh, a colony, basically, of the United States. Exactly. But, but they go along with it anyway. At least they're unlike the Indians you're describing. Unlike the, the Indians, score. exactly. They know the score. <laughs> uh, let me ask you now, Biden's, a Biden administration would not in any way change uh, or maybe make more aggressive a, a containment strategy and to try to disrupt Russian Chinese integration, as you were discussing from Valdai. Is that yes. how they see it? The Ab Biden abs Biden? Absolutely correct, Joe. Because, because uh, okay, the, the three, uh, th this is 90% uh, of what I have been writing for the past five years at least. I think practically every, each and every column that I write is linked to this ongoing process of Eurasian integration in myriad levels, geopolitical, geoeconomic, trade, investment, connectivity, and all that. And the three major poles are Russia, China, and Iran, which uh, little by little, they are integrating uh, slowly but surely. We have many examples the Russia-China strategic partnership in so many levels. And now, like Putin said a few days ago, and everybody in the US was like, ah, military, direct military uh, collaboration at the highest level in terms of even exchanging military secrets. It's, go, it's, it's a military alliance in the making. I, I would say medium to long term. But Putin himself, on the record, already said it's possible. No? We have the famous uh, uh, 25 year, $400 billion Iran China deal, which is uh, basically 
trade, investment, connectivity, uh, Chinese investment in the, the Iranian uh, energy industry, which is essential. They don't have that kind of money. Uh, modernization of, of Iran in terms of building uh, uh, metro lines like they were building in Tehran, uh, high-speed rail, uh, fiber optics, all that. The integration of uh, the, the different corridors of the new Silk Roads, no? uh, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, the Chinese, the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which, you know, they, as part of the, this corridor, they inaugurated a few days ago the first metro in Lahore in Pakistan. It's, it's something huge. Lahore is an enormous city. Uh, circulation is an absolute mess. And now they have their first metro line. Can you imagine? So this is, this is something we, we're going to see soon in Islamabad, in Karachi, in major uh, Pakistani cities. Chinese technology, and it's part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor which is the link to uh, Gwadar especially and the Arabian Sea, which is an extra outlet for the Chinese. You know. So all, all this is proceeding in tandem. You know. And then Russia, the same thing, a lot of Chinese investment in Eastern Siberia. And something that has been discussed at the highest level as well, the integration of the, both Koreas with Eastern Siberia. So this means South Korea will have a direct land-based access to the Eurasian continent. And this is something that they don't have at the moment because North Korea is in the middle. So what do we have? We have Putin, <laughs> Moon, and Kim Jong-un Kim Jong -un sitting down together and say, okay, how are we going to unite the Korean Peninsula and then unite us with Eastern Siberia, you Russians? Ongoing process, they have been discussing this for at least the past two years, irrespective of the, uh, 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 the, the Trump Kim Jong un meetings. You know. so, uh, th so, this is all proceeding in parallel, in tandem, uh, uh, you know, uh, in different levels. And, and you have other important players in Central Asia or Pakistan or Turkey they are slowly but surely being integrated as well. So, so if you look at what may happen in the next 15 years, which is a horizon that the Chinese themselves included in the five-year plan, they have something called Vision 2035. 2035 for the Chinese is very important because it's the midterm between where we are now and 2049, the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. And in 2035, they had already planned. They, in fact, it's three, three five-year plans in one that they discussed last week. You know, Not only this one until 2025, where they plan to be one of the top technological powers in the world, but they plan all the major steps to arrive in 2035 as the top in virtually everything. And that includes, of course, the expansion of all these new Silk Road corridors. Six of them plus the Maritime Silk Road, everywhere in Asia. So uh, uniting East Asia all the way to Turkey and Eastern Europe and arriving in those major destinations in Western Europe, in, uh, in Germany especially, in Venice, in Madrid by, a tra by train, in London by train as well. So, so in, in <laughs> you've never seen anything like this in history. It's an enormous trade investment connectivity process uniting the whole of Eurasia. And they, have, they are starting. Uh, if, you, if you look at the um, official timetable, next year, 2021, starts the implementation phase. So we're not even implementing, according to the Chinese. What happened these past seven years since they announced the New Silk Road seven years ago, it's the pre-planning, setting up projects, starting projects and all that. The real thing starts next year. And, and, and then we have one of those uh, beautiful <laughs> cosmic coincidences when the Chinese economy will start to pick up again, like, you know, like there's no tomorrow. 
because they they are already over COVID, you know. So next year, I expect the Chinese economy to boom like crazy. And obviously, they'll have enough extra funds to invest in all these connectivity proje projects outside of China as well. So this, this is what they discussed in the, in the five-year uh, plan. Uh, the official denomination is uh, dub double, double, double development dynamic, translated from Mandarin. So uh, invest a lot in the domestic economy and at the same time invest in all these projects. Uh, go, uh, China goes west, right? Go, goes west, uh, uh, arriving in Europe. And, uh, you know, I, I follow what is discussed in the U.S. about that. The only thing that I see is Belt and Road is a debt trap. Belt and Road is a Chinese domination uh, in the rest of the world. Belt and Road is a communist subversion, etc. They don't analyze the facts. They don't analyze how this, this, how this is being developed. Well, Pepe, by let me Chinese. interrupt you a second. Yes. Um, as you were describing all those things, these incredible things with Putin and the South Koreans and linking Russia with the uh, United Korean Peninsula, I'm thinking people in the corridors of the Pentagon and the CIA, the State Department, they can't do anything. What can they do no. about it? They go, it drives them crazy. What could they do about it? You're right, Joe. Uh, what, what they can do about it, uh, apart from uh, launching uh, examples of hybrid war here and there. So, okay, let's... Uh, <laughs> Let's try to destabilize Xinjiang, you know. <laughs> Probably, let's, let's send some special forces to connect with the Xinjiang separatists over there. The Chinese already know about this shit for decades, you know. Uh, let's try uh, some sort of provocation in Ukraine. The, 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 the people in Donbass, they have been fighting this since uh, for six years now, in fact. Uh, let's try something in Taiwan. Chinese know the whole thing, and they, they know that any provocation, would, and, and in fact, now they are, uh, if you talk to Chinese analysts, now they tell you right away, if there is an American provocation against Taiwan, China can invade Taiwan in 24 hours, if it's a serious provocation. And the U.S. would not start a nuclear war against China. You're not going the U.S. is not going to start a nuclear war about Taiwan, obviously not, you know. And South China Sea, we already know what it is. South China Sea is a Chinese lake, period. And this is being discussed between China and the other, and the other nations in, this, in the South China Sea. The, 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 they are establishing a, what they call a code of conduct in the South China Sea, something they have been discussing for the past two years or so. Uh, of, of course, there, there will have to be concessions towards Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, etc. It will happen. Right? And for instance, in the case of Indonesia, the Chinese are not try, trying to encroach into Indonesian islands, very close to Indonesian territory, very far away from China. They understood. So they're, 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 they're starting to be more diplomatic the way they deal with the other uh, countries that surround the, the South China Sea. But, but, but all of them more or less agree that uh, this is something that has to be so, uh, solved and discussed by South China Sea nations. No foreign interference. So what the Americans can do about it? More FNOPs, fr freedom of navigation operations. So what? <laughs> These are like fleas around a dog, basically. <laughs> it attempts by the US to to stop this process that's inexorable, it cannot. It's inevitable. It's under it, it, the Biden administration, would the ramp up attempts to disrupt, ramp up these uh, hybrid war activities? What do you think? Or, de definitely, Joe, because uh, once again, the, the blob will be in charge now 100%. Right. So this is official deep state policy. And it's against the uh, the alliance of peer competitors. Now, something that uh, Brzezinski in his grave <laughs> shouts about every day, right? So this is not going to change. I, I think, in fact, it's going to pick up uh, steam. Uh, and, that, and that's why uh, the Chinese and the Russians especially are very guarded and they know what can happen starting next year with a damn presidency. They have absolutely no 
illusions about it. There will be provocations. And probably the first one on the list would be something in Syria, which we don't know exactly what, what would be. But it would be in areas that uh, the, the US already is in the Northeast, where they are basically uh, exploiting the oil, stealing Syrian oil, right? Or it could be a reinforcement of those uh, American bases near the Syria Iraqi border, for instance. Any, any you know, a, a, anything. So it's um, the Iranians also have no uh, illusions. Uh, they expect, and this is something not necessarily Ayatollah Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guards, but the Ministry of Foreign Relations, Zarif's people, they expect that the US will be back to JCPOA next year. Uh, in fact, almost everyone around uh, this area, Southeast Asia, expects the Americans to be back, but we don't know exactly how they will be back. But there will be at least some sort of convergence into, okay, let's uh, revive the JCPOA. So maybe this is the, the only positive news in all this mess, you know. <laughs> Elizabeth, you have anything you want to jump in with? Sure. I, I hope that our audio is back. I've been alerted by chat that we lost audio for a while there. So, oh, that's bad. So hopefully, we're back. I'm just glancing at chat. We are. Doesn't look like we are yet, but I'll. No, I'll there's take... no audio. Yeah. Let's take a couple of seconds. It's fixed. Okay. Okay. Liz. All right. Um, if, if you have a question, I have several yeah, more. Yeah, sure. Questions. Go ahead. And we, I, I have a few questions from chat here, and they may be relatively short to answer, but I thought I'd throw them at you anyway. So one of them is uh, whether uh, China and Iran and that their connection will prevent the U.S. bombing Iran or, I, you know, suppose uh, increasing tension with Iran? Definitely, because uh, now there is, a, it's not acknowledged in public. But China has made a commitment in the background to the to the Iranian leadership that uh, you know if you if you are in dire straits in terms of an American operating operation, we got your back. And this is something that the Russians also have made very discreetly. It's part of these uh, talks between uh, Zarif and Wang Yi. You know, Zarif was with Wang Yi in Beijing, uh, what, two weeks ago or so. And Lavrov and Zarif, who get along very, very well, you know. So this, we, we know this is in the cards. And we know that the Americans know about it. <laughs> and obviously, they won't try anything against it. Especially because whatever they try, the level of uh, made-in-Iran weaponry now is very, very serious. And the Pentagon knows it. Not only they gamed it, and everything that they gamed was a disaster from an American point of view. They know that if they try anything in the Persian Gulf, for instance, Iranians can do anything they want. Uh, you know, their coastline is lined up with missiles. They can shut down the Strait of Hormuz in uh, one evening if they want it. They can mine the Strait of Hormuz, for instance. This will provoke a collapse of the global economy, among other things. You know, so. The, this obviously the Intel environment knows about. It. So uh, once again, going back to the possible o o only good news in all that, this would imply that uh, a damn presidency would start some sort of rapprochement with Iran starting next year. But let's have no illusions once again. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And so one of the things we were talking about earlier on the stream was the potential for Kamala Harris to be a, a relatively strong war hawk. And given the fact that Biden isn't all there at this point and that he his presidency probably will be, if not in not fully taken over by Kamala Harris, at least, you know, in principle, he won't be the person really at the helm of the ship. What does that look like for foreign policy? How dangerous is that? in terms of a World War III type scenario? I mean, if in the absolute worst case scenario, what do you think would develop under a Kamala Harris presidency? Well, Kamala Harris in terms of foreign policy is a cipher, isn't it? I'm not sure anyone in the US knows about Kamala Harris foreign policy views. <laughs> 
So we don't, it's a cipher. This means you'll be under total control of the deep state machinery. And that's, that's why it's so dangerous. Of course, Biden, the same thing, assuming he survives a few months into the presidency. Uh, don't forget that technically he is on stage two uh, dementia. Né? I, I talked to some professionals. They told me it's stage two dementia. He can, they can keep him up with meds, with drugs, but the rot of, of, uh, in the mind is irreversible. It takes a while. Sometimes it takes weeks. Sometimes it takes months. Sometimes it takes one year or two. And all of us who had a similar experience on a family level, which is my case with my mom, for instance, you, you, you can tell right away. You cannot fool. If, if we dealt with a similar situation, you just look at his pattern of behavior, his eyes, and you immediately detect it, you know. And so it's not going to last long. And then we're going to have a cipher as commander in chief. Wow. <laughs> Absolutely. Oof. I mean, we really can see his decline. I mean, it, it just in the last week or so, we saw him can seem to confuse Trump's name with George Bush's name and his wife Jill was next to him mouthing Trump, you know, and he's, he's had a few sentences that were absolute gibberish. It's really becoming very clear. And but the question also does from the chat arises that uh, who will decide America's America's foreign policy? And that does relate a little bit to what, what is Kamala Harris going to be like, but also forgetting her for a second, what behind the scene really controls American foreign policy? Some people think that it's you know Israel. Some people have different opinions, whether it's defense contractors. What's your take on that? Uh, it's, it's, it's a mix uh, of all that. It's a mix of Israel, of course, the extremely powerful defense contractors uh, and the revolving door around the defense contractors. And some very specific characters that will be very powerful in the next administration, like uh, Tony Blinken, probably the National Security Advisor, and Michel Flournoy, probably head of the Pentagon. So you, you just look at the background of these people, in fact. We're talking about imperial functionaries. If you look at what they did before, you have a pretty good idea what they're going to do afterwards. You know. So it's, it's a concourse of circumstance and uh, the solidified machine of the deep state, uh, which is no wonder a lot of people around the global south are very, very worried about it. Uh, for instance, in, in, uh, to give a South American example, uh, I, I talked to some good friends in Argentina, for instance, anal analysts. They say that essentially, well, next year they're going to come not only against Bolivia and Venezuela, but against us as well in Argentina. And that's absolutely no question. Brazil is a different craze because Brazil at the moment is a colony. It's a neo it's, it's one of the most pathetic uh, geopolitical developments of the past 100 years or so. How... They managed to turn Brazil into a neo-colony in a matter of uh, three or four years, in fact, e even before the coup against Dilma, which was four years ago. Argentina is uh, it's complicated because Argentina has very close relations with China. And Argentina can uh, be the spark for another pink tide in South America. So the deep state is going you know, to come out all guns blazing destabilizing Argentina. So it's going to be a hybrid war all over the place. You know. And Bolivia, they're not going to let Bolivia to be relatively independent. Forget it. Out of the question. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a very good um, point you made about those of us who've had parents. And my father had dementia. Mm -hmm. And it, just the other day, I was telling someone, when I see Biden, I see my father. I thought that was my father. Of course, Joe. Of course. The vacant look in the face. The vacant look. Is a, it was the first thing that struck me uh, months ago already. The vacant look. And that, that's it. You know, you, you cannot disguise that. You can take tons of meds. 
but it just slows down an irreversible process, you know. Yeah, my grandfather's the same way. Same way, same thing. So all of us who had a, a, a familiar experience with it, we can detect it right away, right? right? I've got to talk to you about Ukraine now because um, as we all know from the famous leaked conversation between Victoria, <laughs> I forgot what nickname you had for Victoria, but uh, Victoria Newland and I Jeff call her Maid Maid Dunn Cookie Distributor. Okay, <laughs> Maid Dunn Cookie. Yeah, and with Jeffrey Piat, the then American ambassador, they were discussing who was going to leave Ukraine weeks before uh, Yanukovych was overthrown. They decide on Yatsenok and Yatsenok. So they were talking about a coup. I mean, there's no way you could deny that. And yes. they didn't deny it. And the American press and only talked about, oh, she said, fuck the EU. Like, that was the whole story. That was basically, it was nothing what she said, but they distracted it. But the key thing there, she says, Joe Biden and the UN, Joe Biden is going to kind of glue this all together. That Joe, is going to have a key role. And guess what? The coup took place. Joe had became basically the viceroy of the United States to run Ukraine, where he was bullying in ministries, including the justice ministry, to get rid of that prosecutor who, under testimony in a court case in Austria, said he fired me because I was going to investigate his son's company. And by the way, how did his son get on the company? Now, I don't know. There's no proof Biden put his son there. But this is like 19th century colonialism. You take over a country, you install your people in. You install people. your people. The Treasury Secretary, the a former State Department uh, a U.S. official, became the finance minister of Ukraine the day after she got Ukrainian citizenship. And Jeffrey Archer is a family friend of the Kerrys, and he was a partner with Hunter Biden in Burisma. We were writing about this. I'm sure you were too. At the time, it was happening. And then Monsanto got contracts, so it was a complete takeover because he, they were afraid once Yanukovych said he wasn't going to go with the EU, he was going to go to the Russian deal. That was it. The coup was started. So now Biden is going to become president, it looks like. We're still watching to see what happens in Pennsylvania. If he's president, he, he might remember a thing or two about Ukraine. And there's <laughs> this scandal, this scandal erupted that almost you know, that may have hurt him because it's not a landslide that many people predicted against Trump. So maybe exactly. the scandal that the the Twitter tried to suppress that the New York Post published that Greenwald had a quit over. Maybe that hurt him. What is you said at the beginning of our conversation? You thought Biden was going to start ramping up, uh, uh, maybe a hardcore military aid to Ukraine to to hard to heat up the civil war in the Donbass. I want you to tell me more about that. Now Trump, Obama didn't want to give hard military hardware. Trump did, but yet there was never really. Um, uh, a re-emergence of that war. Now, tell us about what Biden would do and about whether the Minsk, the Minsk uh, uh, plan is even on life support or not. Yes, it's what the deep state would do, Joe, in fact. Uh, they simply cannot get over the fact that uh, there was a military defeat in the Donbass in 2014. Uh, when, when I went to Don uh, I went to Donetsk in 2015, in early in the spring of 2015, and they took me to the battlefield. It was an absolutely amazing sight. It was a relatively circumscribed battlefield of what 20 square kilometers or so. This was the key battle between the Donetsk, Donetsk Luhansk forces and the Kiev forces, and it was a rout. You know, and I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure our friends in the Pentagon who game wars and all that, they were stunned because it was uh, that classic cauldron uh, Russian uh, tactic. You surround your enemy and your enemy inside is in a cauldron and then you devastate your enemy from all angles. This is exactly what happened. It, it's about uh, three hours away from Donetsk, you know. So they want revenge. But how? You know, the, the, the Kiev's military forces are a joke. The only thing that they know, uh, the only thing that they do, in fact, is to shell uh, suburbs of Donetsk, for instance, or the airport, for that matter. That's they, they, they don't have a... a cohesive military capable of staging an advance and taking over Luhansk, 
Donetsk and or at least parts of Donbass. So what what could they do? Uh, send special forces and uh, you know subvert. Or, they are, they already did this uh, years ago. They killed the governor of Donetsk. You remember that? Nah? Yeah. Uh, send special forces to Donetsk and Lugansk. It's not you know you, you're not going to conquer any territory with that. You know? and, and what remains of the industry in Donbass is linked to Russia already. It was and remains linked to Russia already. Anyway, again, right? So. Uh, even if they create, uh, let's say, a more militarized front, trying to draw Russian uh, forces in, the Russians won't take the bait. First of all, because the, the people in Donbass are very well organized and they have enough military forces, including uh, Cossack militias, you know. I, I visited one, one of them, talked to one of their commanders. And all. They're very, very well organized on a village level. You know, it's, uh, uh, you can even draw a parallel with Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, you know, in villages in southern Lebanon, you know. Very well organized, very well weaponized, in connectivity, you know, word of mouth. So it's important to conquer a territory like that unless you have a, a blitzkrieg you know a juggernaut which is not going to happen what about Zelensky? does uh would he go along with an escalation of the u.s was he strong enough to resist that we don't know that's a good question joe we don't know we really don't know he's been trying to play yeah. and our right to vote sorry that was ah. CNN <laughs> in there. Who, uh, who who was that was cnn <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, no, no news for the moment. Huh? No, no fresh news now. Huh? This past few minutes, at least. No, Biden closing in on the presidency is what. Uh, closing in on both uh, uh, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, Georgia and Pennsylvania, right? We thought we might have an answer by now. That's why we went on the air. But I'm enjoying this conversation immensely with you, Pepe. It's more interesting. Thank than you. My, my, my pleasure. <laughs> But I, I, I like I like that you you ask me questions that I need to try to find. For instance, uh, I'm not following Ukraine for the past few weeks, for obvious reasons, you know. So, but I, I assume there are no new facts on the ground, and I, I recommend seriously for all of you watching us, go to Stalker Zone, and read a guy called Rostislav Ichenko. His articles are translated into English. I met Rostislav in Moscow. The guy knows everything about Ukraine. He's absolutely brilliant. And they translate most of his uh, top columns into English, and they publish at Stalker Zone. So if you read the Ischenko, you're going to have a pretty good idea of what's really going on on the ground in the Ukraine. I'm going to read it before they shut it down, before they take it off the internet. Before they shut it down, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But if you go through, for instance, if you share what they what they publish on VK, the Russian, uh, the Russian Facebook, let's put it this way, yeah. no problem. But if yeah. you if you if you try to to link to them on Facebook, uh, forget it. No way. Or or Twitter, forget. It. We've got a number of different questions in chat. They're ranging on, on a lot of different subjects. Uh, the latest one was, what are the chances for chances for a revival of the TPP, in your opinion? Uh, uh, absolutely zero. Because, <laughs> you know, uh, really, absolutely zero, because the successor of the TPP, which at the time was the competitor, is the RCEP, which is going to be signed, if not in December. <laughs> Well, they are postponing this forever. If not in December, early next year. And uh, like we discussed, everybody's on board except India. So, th so they don't need a TPP. <laughs> uh, we've got another question. What about, uh, please tell us about the ongoing de-dollarization of efforts in Eurasia. Ooh, wow. <laughs> Need hours for this. <laughs> but yeah, not to, not to ask you to speak for an hour on that one question. Exactly. <laughs> shortly. Well, uh, all the major players, which means Russia, China, and Iran, they are 
increasingly trying to bypass the US dollar. And some of them are actually bypassing en masse the US dollar. The thing is how they're going to coordinate. This would be the next step. So there are discussions already on how they're going to coordinate their payment systems. The Chinese payment system, uh, the Russian payment system, and later they could bring Iran as well. So then you have a sort of alternative SWIFT bypassing the US dollar. All of this, once again, it's long term, but already started and it's ongoing, right? Uh, in bilateral uh, uh, trade, for instance, China and Iran, as far as we know, they are completely bypassing the US dollar. Uh, China, Russia, they are getting to close to 50% of their trade in uh, respective currencies, robo and yuan. So as you can see, this thing is progressing very, very fast. The thing is to bring other major uh, Eurasian players on board. Pakistan, India is going to be impossible, at least for short, medium term. Pakistan, Turkey, uh, the Central Asians. So this is something that is being discussed at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization level. Uh, of course, between uh, the People's Bank of China and the Russian Central Bank and all that. So, but it, it, it's ongoing. It's ongoing. Uh, they know, and, and this is something they started discussing at the BRICS set, uh, sessions already in the late 2000s, to give an idea of how long this is way back, you know, when Lula was still the Brazilian president, Lula was a big, big, big driver of uh, we need to do the trade amongst us by passing the dollar. And at the time uh, was uh, Medvedev and Hu Jintao. They obviously, they loved it. So they started discussing this around 2009, 2010. So now we're uh, 10 years later, you know, when, when you compare to what was happening 10 years uh, earlier, wow. Big territory, you know. Uh, I, I would say, realistically, we can have a great deal of Eurasia by passing US dollar and trading their own currencies or in a basket of currencies in 10 years' time by 2030. And certainly, by to, according to the Chinese, officially, certainly by 2035, because they see 2035 as China with a convertible yuan and the yuan as an international currency. So this means they're going to do all their trade in yuan. And everybody will have to adapt, including that famous, uh, the famous day, the fateful day when the Chinese are going to disembark in Riyadh and tell the House of South, from now on, it's you and only guys. <laughs> and I cannot imagine what the U.S. economy is going to look like on that day. It will not be pretty. Well, it's uh, from, a, from a Washington point of view, it's enough grounds to launch a nuclear attack against Saudi Arabia. Exactly. No, I mean, it doesn't look good in terms of the economy. It would look very bad in terms of war. No question. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Bleak, bleak outlook. So another question was, do you think the withdrawal from the Middle East will continue? And I don't no. know that that's predicated on, I don't know that we've truly withdrawn it, but yeah, that's the question. Uh, yes, it, it, it requires a, a very complex answer because... If you ask the deciding instances of the deep state, they will say never. So this means maintaining that ridiculously massive embassy in Baghdad with lots of contractors inside and in the vicinity, uh, maintaining lily pads here and there, including Syria. Yeah? Maintaining all the big bases in Qatar, in the Emirates. So, uh, no. <laughs> Realistically, they, they won't back down. The thing is, uh, uh, for instance, if you think in terms of the wide, the, the greater Middle East, to come back to Condoleezza Rice's uh, terminology, Afghanistan, sooner or later, they will have the only thing practically 
that is going to be left in Afghanistan is going to be Bagram, which is a huge base as well. Uh, but you have the Taliban talking to the Afghan government, the Pakistanis, the Indians, the Chinese, the Russians, and the Iranians, all within the, the framework of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, trying to find a solution for Afghanistan only with Asians. And that obviously will imply no foreign bases in Afghan territory. So this, this would be the big, big deal in the next two, three, four years. And I'm sure the deep state, they're going to do every, they're gonna, you know, every dirty trick in the book to try to convince uh, the, the, the government in Kabul that they need American protection, which in fact, is that a cat? Yes, it is a cat. Yes, it's my sister's cat. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm a big cat uh, uh, person, so the, oh, he's beautiful. Yeah, he's very pretty. So the cat, the cat interfered with our Afghan talk. <laughs> well, the last question was going to return to Trump, and it was it was someone asking, I want to know Pepe's comments on the media censorship of Trump's announcements, and we have talked a little bit about media censorship today, but that was the question. Yes. Wow. Uh, before talking to you guys, I saw that the three networks cut off when Trump started talking about uh, the possibility of fraud in the elections. Well, and he's being obviously directly censored by Twitter. Which he, he, Each of his tweets now is censored, de no. facto censored. So that tells you everything, right? What do you mean? Uh, what networks? Uh, because I saw it on CNN. Look, I, I, uh, before I talk to you, there was a huge headline saying that uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS cut off Trump's uh, talk when he was talking about uh, really? fraud. In the oh, goodness, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, I, uh, well, I, I have to check this out uh, when, when we finish. Yeah, but this is what a huge headline in the Guardian. In fact, oh. uh, I, I think I still have it here. Give me, give me one second. Yeah. Yeah, while you do that, I did. I just want to if, say that I did. If I can, see if I can find it. Yeah. You saw that, Elizabeth? Yeah, I saw a reference to it. Uh, people were referencing, were discussing why they thought it had happened, and some people said it was out of spite, but that was just you know random hot take. So. Hmm. Well, it's news. Whatever he says, as whatever craziness it is, it's we, we got to yeah. do what he has to say. Yeah, it yeah. was one of their, uh, it disappeared as a headline, guys. It was their main headline a few, what, 40 minutes ago. Hmm. Now it's it's not here anymore. Maybe it's in their live results blog. Uh, blah, 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 blah. No, I cannot see it anywhere. Ah, I found it. Censorship Net of censorship. Ne networks cut Trump's speech as some Republicans uh, chastise president over election law. Networks cut Trump's speech. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what happened. You mean as he was speaking when he started saying... As he was... Exactly. As he was speaking. Huh. That's quite something, isn't it? It is. <coughs> CNN credit, they showed the whole thing. CNN yeah, sh showed the whole thing. Well, at so, least. Yeah. <coughs> that's... Uh... Well, we got to know what he's saying. I mean, yeah, I wrote my article on conservative news based on, on seeing him speak on on CNN. So uh, we got to say we got to know what he has to say. Uh, that's well. Uh, apparently, no smoking gun again. But he was reiterating that uh, you know there's fraud everywhere I and see. there are lawsuits. Uh, we are investigating, etc. That used to happen at the UN and the General Assembly when the Syrian ambassador began speaking. Suddenly, the, there was a technical difficulty. A technical difficulty, yeah, right? Like yes. Times <laughs> when you know, over a couple of months, every time he wants to speak, they they lost the sound somehow. Uh, so uh, they're not saying they're not giving a reason that ABC uh, or NBC, whatever the networks were, they're not giving a reason. They haven't responded. At le at least not yet, Joe. May yeah. Maybe later. At least not I hope yet. They have the guts to say we we did a made editorial decision. We thought it was false. So just like Twitter has been hiding his tweet, well, th th this is probably hide what the comments. This is probably what they're going to say. It's an editorial decision. Wow. F false just information. Like Twitter. No, no. No, just yeah. like Twitter, it gives him an excuse to say he's the victim and the outsider. Well, exactly. And the editorial decision is let him say something, and then you, pull, you pick it apart afterward in your analysis of what he says. That's Exactly. Then you have analysis. 
you have news analysis immediately after the fact, but it, that disappears completely from, from many outlets, right? <laughs> That's scary. Well, maybe they're afraid of one thing, which I understand. It could be that he's riling up his people on the ground, which leads me to my what I wanted to ask you next, Pepper. You lived in the U.S., right? You live in L.A.? You've been yes. all over the country? And in, Wa in Washington as well. Washington. Yeah. So you know the American culture and population. And even if you haven't been living there now, you can understand how it's escalated to this kind of unbelievable. Absol culture. Absol absolutely. I have many good friends in the U.S. who are always uh, in contact. Yeah, absolutely. What is going to happen here in terms of all, a lot may depend on what Trump says and does. Yes. But people are talking about real violence here. I mean, serious violence breaking out over this election. Like in Kenya, a few about 10 years ago, if you remember, there was huge riots after an election. In Kenya. Absolutely. What, what do you what's your take on that? What do you think? Wow. I, there's a strong possibility, depending on the language. Trump employs when he's not going to recognize what would be the final result. In fact, we're not going to have a final result for weeks, right? I think the final result is only by December, right? The final vote tell. The Electoral College has to go. The Electoral College, the first Electoral College meeting is in December, right? Exactly. Yeah, middle of December. So, depending on how he's going to spend this next few weeks, which obviously he won't uh, uh, concede, that's, that's for sure, and how he's going to frame the legal battle which as far as i understand correct me if i'm wrong guys they're going to try to appoint a special counsel to investigate biden right is that a possibility i think that's a strong possibility well there was mm. talk of that before the election but if he wins you, they could still do it yeah they yes. investigated trump yeah exactly exactly and uh how one or two investigations of the laptop from hell are going to proceed from now or if they have a definitive smoking gun linking joe biden directly to everything that was uncovered uh, in the laptop from hell so this could be uh, and he obviously with the the dog whistle is very easy it takes one adjective yeah. or one expression to rally millions of people. So, yeah. and th these people are already fired up. I, I think they are preparing. Uh, I read, I read a lot of chat and blogs of uh, you know right wing. I, ha I have to know what the right right wing is thinking, right? And uh, the impression that I have is that people are getting ready for it, like that famous call to the Proud Boys, now. Nah? Yeah, stand stand, stand by, and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can say that millions of people are standing by at the moment. And, and, ob and obviously they will agree with Trump's uh, analysis of yeah. a fraudulent election. It's not as if things were calm in the U.S. We've had incredible uprisings <laughs> in the last few months. Exactly. And right and left wing fighting each other. And there have been murders and shootings. So exactly. but this is the cauldron into which this now this election is thrown into. In the middle of the pandemic, after the George Floyd murder, the years of frustration of the police. I want to point this out. It just occurred to me that ABC, NBC, and CBS uh -huh. are free over-the-air television. So people yes. who want to watch CNN have to pay for that. They have to pay, exactly. Now, Trump's, a lot of Trump supporters are not very well off, let's face it. They are uh, unemployed. They're badly employed. They uh, yeah, So they may not have cable. So ABC, CBS, and NBC thinking, a bigger audience of ours are Trump supporters than CNN. So we're going to cut it off. I wonder if that was the thinking. That's a very good point, Joe. Very, very good point, in fact. And I, I was looking at the breakdown of age. I, I found a table that is, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Voting by age. Uh, most of the votes for biden were between 18 and 29 so the woke generation voted biden and people over 65 you know uh, the vote for trump was uh, you know negligible practically nothing they didn't even vote they didn't even care to vote so 
Yes, yeah, so we got so you have a cleavage between the woke generation and over 65s on one side and rural and urban on the other side. And they intersect these two cleavages now. By the way, that Senate investigation uh, would have to take place before maybe before January because right now that's 48 to 48 in terms of, we still don't have a, the Senate uh, elections in yet. Exactly, there are two two seats, uh, is that, and these two seats are in Georgia, right? If I'm not mistaken, is it, is it in Georgia? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I'd have to click on this and find out. I'll tell you in a second. Uh, 48 Democrats, 48 Republicans. One flipped seat, two flipped by the Democrats. Uh huh. Georgia, e, yeah, Georgia is only counted 98. percent That's correct. And right. North Carolina is not in yet either. Georgia. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, the Republicans. Yeah, but but the, the projections Republican. are basically saying that uh, they're going to keep the Senate. Well, the Republicans yeah. are leading in both North Carolina, very very razor thin, and uh -huh. in Georgia and in Alaska, by the way. And in Alaska, exactly. That yeah. they're going to win, uh, but that I think was already Republican. So uh, yes, no. it was already Republican. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it looks like the Republicans could gain control of the Senate here if they win Georgia and North Carolina. But if it's a 50-50 tie, as you know, then it depends who's in the White House. Because the vice who's president in the White House, House exactly. Breaks the tie. That but so, so far, uh, most of the projections are giving the Senate to, to the Republicans. A and in the House, the Democrats, they lost a lot of seats in the yeah. House, which is crazy, yeah. completely crazy. Yeah, the Republicans will keep the uh, Senate most likely. Yes, most uh, likely. But by a, by a hair. And, and the House, let's look at the House. Yeah, they're down five seats. Down five seats. Down yeah. five Which is seats. a lot. 33 remain to be uh, decided. So, um, Republicans have a chance even. And that net, now it's net six gain uh, of the Republicans. They have an outside chance. They only trail 209 to 193. That's uh, 16 seats. It's so, not much. Point. Yes. Amazing. This is uh, supposed to have been a blue wave. This is supposed to have been Biden. Blue. <laughs> <laughs> the, the only blue wave is uh, Manchester City playing in England. You know, that's yeah. a blue wave. <laughs> <laughs> Give me just your take on, on, the, on the primary and what happened with Sanders. And, and, what's, and Sanders' reaction to that, how he... He said, I'm going to go for Biden, but without using the leverage he had to get any commitments. Towards he his folded, no? Joe, he folded. He folded immediately afterwards. He, he, he didn't fight internally, and then he immediately collapsed, folded completely, and joined the Biden camp. Wow. People who admire Sanders everywhere, like, you know, in Brazil, for instance, or in Europe, in Italy, in Spain or France, where he's very popular, by the way, they were like, how come? You know, he didn't even put up a fight. Yeah, he had all, he had the his huge base behind him. That huge base. Dem so Central Democrats need that base to win. They needed them. He yes, could throw them over a barrel and say, I want this, I want that, I want that, and you better, if you don't come through, there's going to be trouble. But he didn't do anything. At least well, Corbyn, they had to kick Corbyn out of the Labour Party. This guy did it. They all. had to kick Corbyn, exactly. And with those bogus anti Semitism accusations, it's completely absurd. Yeah. Totally absurd. I guess they didn't do it to Bernie because he's Jewish. So that would be hard. No, nah, you, you can't do it to Bernie, exactly. But Bernie, if Bernie was the candidate, he would probably be elected by 9 p.m. This would be the second term. On election day. Yeah. If, if they'd allowed him to run last time, this would be his second term, probably. Exactly, it'll be his second term. Absolutely, it's a disgrace. Um, well, but uh, you cannot. Uh, but the the dem environment, wow, it, it's worse than the blob itself. It's part of the blob, of course, but it's worse than the blob itself. It's it's uh, in a class by itself, in terms of internal corruption. Eh? And if this investigations over the laptop from hell. <laughs> the, the the problem is, can you trust this Republican team? You know, Giuliani, this you cannot trust these people, you know. You have to be an independent investigation. 
what's the real story about the laptop from hell? But an independent investigative commission, you know, which is not going to happen. No, Pepe, the way I understood it, and I didn't delve very deeply into this story, but Biden did make these deals, but right after he left office, like two months into 2017, uh, it was like right. March. Right was, after was, he left yeah. office. So exactly. that it was legal then in a way. But he may have set it all up while he was still vice president and used clearly the, his influence in that office yes. to get what he wanted. That's the allegation. But that he closed the deal when he was no longer in government. So there's nothing illegal about what he did. Absolutely. And, and that's the problem with uh, they don't have a smoking gun. My I'm, problem, not, I'm not sure they're going to find one. Right. My problem is the coup d'etat that the U.S. Uh, directed in Ukraine that overthrew a corrupt but democratically elected president, Viktor Yanukovych. That but, never gets mentioned by the Republicans. No, it never gets or mentioned. the Democrats. That's the backdrop to this whole story about Ukraine. Yes, it never gets it mentioned, never, Joe, and it, and it will never be investigated in the U.S. Never. No. Never. Never. You know, at least the Britain, they had the Chilcot inquiry about Iraq. Yes. They never, never investigate their major international crimes, basically. And uh, that will never be known. That's excised. None of it was investigated by government, by, by the press. They mm -hmm. completely buried this role that the U.S. played in the overthrow of that government, allowing Biden and others to go in there. To go in there, running yeah. Running the country as the viceroy. And if you don't put that into the background of the story, if it's only this laptop here or, uh, you know, uh, the whole thing about the prosecutor, it's isolated. It's part of Biden's role in Ukraine, and he got away with it. That really annoyed me, I have to say. He got away with it. He's going to become president now. But, but you know, the, the, the deep state and the, the, the U.S. establishment can get, a, you know, in different parts of the global south, you can get away with virtually everything. They, they, they got away with everything that they set up for the coup in Brazil against Dilma, right, right. which started way back in 2010 with the NSA. They got away scot-free. Uh, they can get away with uh, all the bribing that went on in Hong Kong last year. Mm -hmm. you, you know that the former uh, U.S. ambassador in Hong Kong is here now in Bangkok? No. Aha, nice, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. color, color, color revolution now is 2, 000, 2 wow. hours, 45 minutes. <laughs> you know, he took, he took a plane in Hong Kong and landed here in Bangkok. It's got to work when he landed. Exactly. Very quickly, I have a very fast question for you from chat. We've been repeatedly asked if you have a Twitter handle, and if so, what is it? No, I don't have Twitter because uh, you know why I don't have Twitter? Because I thought I would become a slave and tweet 50 times a day, like most people I know do, you know. And never I read think another article again. Yes, but maybe next year, uh, I think I'm going to start uh, next year with a Twitter account and transfer everything that I publish on my Facebook to Twitter, because sooner or later, I'm going to be expelled from Facebook. Well, exactly. So, so they'll do the job for you. You won't be a slave. They'll just kick you off, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So uh, I, I, I was suspended a few, two or three weeks ago. It was very funny. I sent them a very professional letter. Uh, which I assume was read by uh, a human. I said, look, you can uh, blacklist a journalist from Asia Times. Why don't you do the same with a journalist from the New York Times or the Financial Times? So I'm sure that stung a little bit, you know. So a few hours later, my account was back. <laughs> Not on Twitter, though. You're talking about Facebook? Yes, yeah, Facebook. Uh, yes, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and VK. The, the, the problem is I try to, to bring a lot of people from Facebook to VK, but they don't migrate. Mm. It's, it's very complicated to convince people to, to change the social networks. <laughs> Another question ah. from the chat was uh, what your thoughts are on Epstein and the Maxwells. Takes us a little bit off the election topic. But... Oh, oh, well, I read everything that Whitney Webb published. And I think she got she got to the heart of it. I, it it's the, it's the best stuff that I read about Epstein or was what Whitney did. Very very good. Very very really very good. I think uh, uh, the whole mechanism is there. The thing is, obviously, we don't. Uh, it's impossible for us to get to the 
masterminds of the whole story. We have a pretty good idea of who they are. But once again, no smoking guns. No? And I'm very curious to what uh, this lane has that nobody, nobody knows yet. And what she has, the FBI has. And what they're going to do about it. <laughs> Maybe she has something that they don't have, and that's a get out of jail card. Well, this is what she implied, right? Yeah. But for the moment, nothing. She, she could leak it if, if she wanted. But you know damn well that even if she had absolute video evidence of Clinton in bed with a 12 year old and Trump, that we're never going to hear that. Right. They would protect exactly. those people. That class, yeah. that class of people never get prosecuted in the United States. Of course States. not. Never. Of course, exactly. Of course not. And. Uh, and Joe Biden, we could add uh, Joe Biden to it. You know, it, it depends on the professionalism involved in this uh, investigations in the Senate or through a special counsel. From now on, I don't trust these Republican lawyers at all. I don't. I don't know about you, Joe and, and Liz, but uh, I'm not yeah. sure these guys are up to it. Yeah, but well, the evidence has to be made public, and some of it has. The emails have. And the, the real smoking gun guy, if there, he is one, is the business partner who... The business partner, Bobuli, Bobulinski, right? Yeah, you yeah. went off record. That, yes. That yeah. was significant, I think. But the Democratic media totally buried that purposely. But, Just like they did the Burisma story, which was, it was debunked. He kept saying it's been debunked by... But by whom? Who by whom? It? Exactly. Who investigated it? The press yeah, yeah. didn't investigate it. Government agencies didn't investigate it. Uh, Ukraine didn't investigate it. Because you fired the guy who was, <laughs> you put the guy in there who wasn't going to investigate it. Who investigated? How could you say it was debunked? And that was it. Okay, it was debunked. Oh, I see. I'm, you know, he, like you were saying before, especially outside the US, they can huh? get away with everything. A coup. With everything. And an invasion, a major invasion of a sovereign nation in the Middle East, namely Iraq, killed hundreds of thousands of people. And you don't even have an investigation in the U.S. You get away Absolutely. with everything. The CIA operates in a jungle. There is no international law that the U.S. respects. So they can commit any crime they want, from assassination to drug dealing to bribing politicians. And that's what they've been doing since they were created. And where, in what form will they ever be investigated or tried? Never. So Never. Can, having that impunity... That money and that power, I mean, it's never because it's the essence of the system. If you don't, destroy, if there is not a, a systemic earthquake, nothing's going to happen. And we know it's not going to happen. Right. Right. Unfo right. Unfortunately. But and the rest of us across the global south, we, do, we just suffer the consequences. No? Yeah, you don't even get to vote, but uh, he's whoever this president is, is going to affect almost every nation on earth. But even in, the US, even in the U.S., they just drag us along every four years, and then they kick us down the stairs once we vote. It's an inter-ruling class dispute. It's a battle between elites. It has nothing to do with even the American people. Absolutely correct. And, and now, uh, w one of the things that I was, the column that I, I just wrote before talking to you guys, basically it's, uh, a mix of psyops and a world resting federation special <laughs> yeah, set up as this huge circus uh, pitting a mob against another mob uh, with 50% of the country polarized against the other 50%. And you have the guys who run the show in the tribune just observing from above, you know, it's it's fascinating because this is this is supposed to be post modernity, post everything, post ideology, absolute modernity. You know that liquid modernity, as Bauman used to say. And this is what we have: something that <laughs> the the Roman Empire was doing two thousand years ago. You know, it hasn't changed. <laughs> yeah, and you got the media like CNN saying, "This is democracy in action. This is our this is democracy in action." Yeah. Well, you know what? That's the only part of it that they want to preserve to make it look like a democracy that you can vote. That's a very small part, even if it was a, a, a more equitable system in terms of who the candidates are, even in a parliamentary system where, and this proportional representation where small parties can get a, a, a couple of seats in parliament, that's just one part of democracy, having elections, right? Pepe, there's so many more things, having a free press, not having uh, 
monopolies of businesses to control things, having a really independent judiciary. There's a, there's a host of things. Mm -hmm. that make no, up no corruption in the system, in built in the system, in all instances of power. Yes, and, and this, this is democracy. Economic, more or less, more equality economic than we have in the U.S. That's part of democracy. People exactly. who have power because of what they can spend money on. And uh, when you have uh, such a disparity in wealth as we have in the US now, so they can go and vote. I mean, and we know these two candidates were gonna pursue pretty much the same foreign policies. Although you're saying Biden might be even a little bit more uh, on the side of the, uh, of the, the blob as uh, Obama called it. Yeah, because it's, it's not about him. Uh, people tend to personalize everything. It's the system behind him. He's a representative, a flawed Trump. representative of a, a systemic rot. Né? Yeah, Trump tried to disrupt a little bit in his very chaotic way. Exactly. He tried to disrupt a little bit. Uh, and this is something I always discuss with my very well-informed American friends. He didn't go deep enough because he could not, in fact. He tried to disrupt it in his shambolic narcissistic demented way but he did try to, he did try to tweak a little bit you know but uh, it it was just it was just him he, he he didn't he couldn't even pick a decent team yeah to be behind him or no. he was or, there are two interpretations right uh, he was forced to have deep state people surrounding him and policing him and there was nothing he could do about it. First of all, because he doesn't know how the, the Washington system works. When he got there, he didn't know anything about it, right? That's so, right. so you see somebody who tries to tweak 1% uh, of, the, of the system, bah, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I'll give you one example. The, the, the House uh, Committee on Assassinations decreed that in 50 years, all the CIA documents related to the Kennedy assassination had to be released. And those 50 years happened to end in the first year of Trump's presidency. So he started tweeting he was going to have them released. Mm -hmm. Next day, I think, he says, can't do it. CIA told me it's not a good idea or something. I mean, there, you go. Was, there you go. That, there you go. Went against what the House representatives decreed because he was told in no uncertain terms. And you remember, of course, Chuck Schumer, Senator Schumer saying on TV that Trump smart guy, I thought he was a smart guy. You can't go against the intelligence agencies. They have seven ways to Sundays to get back at you. That's an extraordinary statement by a it's U.S. Exactly. on national television. On national television, exactly. And um, <laughs> it, it passes as normality, right? <laughs> yeah, it's accepted. It's, it's accepted. It's accepted, yeah. Uh, but he, he, who knows what happened, why he why he didn't go deeper into the deep state, as you say, and they've tried to, try to get back at him from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Yes. And he, he, was, as he was surrounded, even inside the White House was surrounded. Yeah? Police Apparently we, surrounded. We lost sound again, by the way. Oh. Interesting discussion to be having while we lose sound, but. <laughs> no. Yes, uh, th this, is, this is a discussion it would be great to, I didn't turn it yeah, be great to have with a panel of top uh, US analysts. I would love to hear their different takes on did, did he could could not he go far enough or he tried and he was you know nipped in the bud and the ramifications you know that was an interesting time elizabeth for us to lose our sound kathy bogan our producer says that she didn't touch it it went, it went off by itself and she put it back on again isn't that fascinating didn't touch it <laughs> Yeah, like now I'm beginning. I'm. I don't like to think about this kind of thing at all. I think it's uh, sometimes self-aggrandizing to think the agencies are shutting us down. Yeah, most of us aren't all that important to them. Um, tell them we're recording at our end. We've got all this. No. Time. Yeah, and I'll tell chat that everything will be uh, everything will be restored when we repost it, and that Kathy's got that handled. But okay, that's what I didn't want to say because now they know we got it. <laughs> now they know but we got the tape. Oh. your computer put it on the but you know what's funny though as for in terms of coincidences i mean my internet cut out today in a way that left my provider absolutely stumped they didn't they can't figure out what's wrong with it so i'm not being conspiratorial i just thought i'd throw that in there too yeah but it is funny that we're talking about them 
and maybe they shut up the sound off. We were talking right. about them in unflattering ways. Pepe, but jo jo Joe and Liz, this happens a lot. Uh, I'll give an example. I, I do podcasts with, a, with an independent Brazilian site that uh, is very, very forceful unmasking the Brazilian deep state and its connections with the American deep state as well. These guys were hacked every week. And then one, uh, one day, what, uh, maybe a month ago, it was so blatant that they identified the IPs and they were coming straight from the US. They didn't even disguise the IPs, you know. So they were being attacked directly from, from the matrix, you know. So it happens, it happens all the time. Oof. Yeah. And obviously they keep an eye on consortium news. Obviously, obviously, you know. Well, yeah. I don't know that for certain, but uh, they might. Guys are doing the right thing. So this is a badge. It's a ba take it as a badge of honor, in fact. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they'll learn something. Yes. <laughs> Maybe they'll learn something. <laughs> Peppy, we don't want to keep you any longer. We've gone through a lot of things. So uh, yes, thank you, thank you so much, guys. It was a pleasure talking to you. Really, here, Peppy, loved it. We'll do likewise. It thank you, thank you, Liz, and uh, let's do it again whenever you want, and uh, no problem. Okay. We'll, we will, Peppy. Hopefully, someday it'll be you'll be able to get on an airplane again, and I come visit you again in Bangkok. Be great. Well, I'm so frustrated. I cannot even see my wife. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> oh, she's stuck in Paris. Oh, my goodness. Yes, she's stuck in Paris. Now, she, now, now she's under curfew, stuck in Paris. Oh, oh. She could be it's, it's a nightmare. It's an yeah. absolute nightmare. Yeah. yeah. All right, Pepe, thank you. Okay, again. guys, thank you. All the best. Best of luck. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, that was Pepe Escobar of Asia Times. And uh, if you don't know who he was before that, you know who he is now. So we appreciate to Pepe coming on. Um, again, they haven't called Pennsylvania. They're being, I guess, extraordinarily cautious. It's only, there's still 5% to go. Um, Trump is ahead by what? Well, I, I put those results in about yeah. 10 minutes ago. I think there's a New York Times. Here's what I'd like to do. Um, I would like to take a, he's up by 22,576 votes with 95% reporting. That's Trump in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's 55% still to count of these mail-in ballots for Biden to make up 32,000 votes. So uh, the way they've been talking about it, it looks like he should be able to do that because he's getting about 60, 70% of all these ballots, these mail-in ballots, and it's in the Philadelphia county where there's been a strong Biden support. Elizabeth, what do you think about us taking a bit of a musical break and we'll come back in if you can? To see that sounds you, fine. And then uh, we will see if there's an update on Philadelphia uh, because we've been going strong for actually, uh, believe it or not, we've been on the air for three hours now huh. without Good having taking a breath at least uh, or having a sip of water. So we'll, Maybe see, make everyone time back, fly. we'll see everyone back in about 20 minutes or so, and we can break in if there's a big news, like if uh, Joe Biden becomes president or something like that. Okay, see you later. Bye.